Okay, so my my hours stop. Okay, so just a background on um, this uh, subject for the seminar today. So my thesis title is Pricing Interest Rate Derivatives in an Illiquid Market. And uh, we use the data-driven approach in, to, to, to uh, address this title, where we uh, got a proxy for the short rate in the South African market, and we tried to find evidence of what type of stochastic process should be used in the South African market. So we found no empirical evidence of a diffusion component at low interest rate levels. So that typically is a the interest rate level stayed constant for long times. And it, it was for both proxies that we used, uh, the, which is the three month Java rate and the 91 day T bill rate. And we found empirical evidence that a pure jump model is most appropriate. So for these two parts, we applied statistical tests for jumps on our data and uh, came to our conclusions. So what we use to price interest rate derivatives is a compound Poisson process with non-stationary increments, meaning the intensity of the process is a uh, constant. And we use that to price um, a several interest rate, interest rate derivatives on the forward three-month Jaguar rate. So throughout my um, study, we had to use stochastic calculus um, in every step. And of course, it's not a standard model to use for the short rate. We had to go back to the basic literature of stochastic calculus. And um, well, I found it very difficult to, to, to apply those theorems and to read through those um, textbooks. So we developed our own sort of calculus throughout the heuristically and with our main aim to apply Ito's Lemma and Gerson's theorem, which we then used in our pricing of uh, derivatives. So the objectives of this seminar is to um, firstly define a compound Poisson process, to define the martingale known as a compensated compound Poisson process, to derive the quadratic variation and conditional quadratic variation for a compound Poisson process, state and proof Gerson's theorem, heuristically, and then to apply Gerson's theorem for compound Poisson process with the main result, what are the implications of these results on model calibration for the short run? So, to start off with, start at the start of, of the um, what compound Poisson process are, are, and we start off with a counting process. So a counting process is a stochastic process which has jumps of size 1 at random jumping times. So importantly, it's, it's a process, a continuous, uh, continuous time stochastic process as the, uh, as the jump uh, times can occur at random times, at any time. But the counting process, uh, the state space of the counting process is the natural, natural number 0, 1, 2, etc. So just a picture, sketch, uh, one, a realization of the counting process, process is, is shown in this graph. And from the graph you can uh, see at the jumping times the process is right continuous and the left limits exist. And that's, a co that's called the Cadillac process. At all other times, the jumps are zero. So it's up, the jumps are either one or zero. And then we can define the jumps of a counting process as the right limit minus the left limit. And these values of the jumps are either one or zero. And we can define a counting measure in terms of these jumps. So more specifically, we uh, in the end we use a compound Poisson process. So n is a Poisson process if the increments are independent of the past and if the process has stationary increments. These two conditions imply that increments are Poisson distributed with parameter lambda times t minus s if you have increment n t minus n s. 
Okay, so we will use um, properties of the Poisson distribution throughout the seminar. So, more formally, the definition of a compa compound Poisson process. So, you just at each jumping time, you just um, add a random jump with a probability distribution mu. And importantly, the jumps are independent of the jumping times and therefore independent of the underlying Poisson process. And the jumps are also identically, identically distributed. The intensity lambda is defined and is used um, while the Poisson uh, n t minus n s is Poisson distributed with um, parameter lambda times t minus s and that parameter lambda is called the, the jump intensity. Okay, so the jumps of my compound Poisson process can be written in that way, meaning if a jump occurs the jump is equal to the random variable z n t. Now, there are two ways to represent this um, compound Poisson process. The one is a stochastic integral representation, and that's a classic way to represent um, a stochastic process by way of a stochastic integral. But we decided to rather use the dynamics of the compound Poisson process. So dyt equals z in t times the counting measure. Okay, so moving to Gerson's theorem, we first must define some um, uh, terms. So if x is a stochastic process, we define the conditional expected dynamics of this process x under a measure p as the limit of the conditional expectation of the increments. Now the conditional take, uh, expectation is taken um, conditional on a sigma algebra, but less formally it, the sigma algebra at times t minus delta t just represents the history up until that time t minus delta t. Okay, so from there, we can define a martingale using our notation. So, classically, a martingale is defined as the expected, the conditional expected value of a, a future value of the process equals the current value of the process. So, expected conditional expected value of m t given f s equals m s for s uh, smaller than t, and then if we set s equal to t minus delta t, we can say a martingale uh, process is a martingale if our conditional expected dynamics equals zero. So applying this to Poisson processes and co uh, compound Poisson processes, if we take the conditional expected value of the increments, because a Poisson process, the increments are independent of the past. The conditional expectation is just the expectation of the increment. And because they are identically distributed, the expectation equals lambda delta t. And if we take the limit, then, then del lambda delta t goes to lambda dt. Therefore, our conditional expected dynamics of a Poisson process ju is just equal to lambda dt. And if we sub subtract that quantity from our Poisson process, then we can form a marking. And if Y is a compound Poisson process, we use the same steps as with the Poisson process. Just one property that we'll add here is that if the conditional expectation of the product, if the product are independent random variables, then we can write it as the product of, of the uh, conditional expectations, and therefore we can take the expectation of the jumps out of the out of the conditional expectation, and they are identically distributed by definition. So we have the jumps of z n times lambda d t as the conditional expected dynamics of a, a compound Poisson process. Again, if, if you subtract that quantity from the 
compound Poisson process, we can form a martingale. Then the quadratic variation. So you can define the quadratic variation in terms of these dynamics. For process X, it's just the dynamic squared. For a Poisson process, the uh, quadratic variation is again a Poisson process. This can be heuristically um, derived, and it's uh, standard to, to do that. Uh, but if you just want to get an idea, if the, the counting measure can be seen as a Bernoulli distributed random variable, but also a Poisson distributed random variable, and you use those um, properties to say the con quadratic variation of a Poisson process is um, again a Poisson process. And the quadratic variation of a compound Poisson process, well, there you use the same uh, characteristic prop property we, we just got from a, for a Poisson process. And from there you can say a compound Poisson process, its quadratic variation is again a compound Poisson process got the form of the dynamics of the compound Poisson process, but the jumps are squared. Okay, so now the conditional quadratic variation is the, what we will use in Gerson's theorem, and that's just the conditional expected dynamics of the quadratic variation. Okay, so for a Poisson process, you can easily derive that the conditional quadratic variation of a Poisson process is lambda t as the expected conditional expected dynamics of the quadratic variation equals lambda dt. Here we can say it's equal because the moments of a Bernoulli distributed random variable are all equal, um, well, the square of the Bernoulli distributed random variable expectation is equal to the Bernoulli distributed random variable itself, the expectation thereof. Okay, and then the conditional quadratic variation of Y, again we use the same um, properties of the jump that are identically distributed and independent to get the conditional quadratic variation as the expectation of the jump squared times lambda dt. Okay, and then lastly, before we go on to Gerson's theorem, we need to define the quadratic covariation and the conditional quadratic covariation. So the dynamics of the quadratic covariation of two processes X and Y is just the dynamics of X times the dynamics of Y. And taking the conditional expected dynamics of that quantity, we get the conditional quadratic covariation of processes X and Y. Okay, so now, now we can move on to Gerson's theorem. So, if P star and P are equivalent measures, so that's a technical term, which just means if we've got um, events that have zero probability under measure P, then that event will also have zero probability under measure P star. And if L is a stochastic process or an variable, then with such that the expected value of L is one, and L is a, if L is a martingale under P, and L is defined as a rather nuclear derivative, then we can get to the following lemma. So, if E star is the expectation under measure P star, and E is the expectation under measure P, then we have the following result. This lemma is from a textbook from Kuo, Stochastic Integration from Kuo, and we will use this result in um, our proof for Gerson's theorem. Okay, so now we get to the main theorem. Let E star and E denote the expectation on the equivalent measures P star and P, just as in the lemma. The question that Gerson's theorem addre addresses is how does a martingale under measure P changes, change 
with uh, respect to a measure P star. So if M is a martingale under measure P, that means its expected um, conditional expected dynamics will be zero under P. Then the conditional expected dynamics under P star is not necessarily equal to zero. Okay, so that is important in the applications to, to um, interest rate uh, derivative pricing. Okay, so a martingale can therefore be redefined under measure P star as this, uh, the martingale under measure P minus the result of this conditional quadratic of conditional expected dynamics. Okay, the proof is, uh, is easy if you use lemma, the lemma, which is also not very difficult to derive. So the conditional expected dynamics of the martingale M under measure P star is equal uh, equals the fraction of the conditional um, expectation the empty LT given FT minus over the expected value of LT given FT minus. Now uh, the LT is a martingale, so underneath the line of the fraction you get uh, the expected conditional expected value equals the left limit of L and above the, li the line I just add and subtract the left limit. Then you can divide the formula into two parts, the left hand side because the left limit of your process L is FT minus measurable or is known at time T minus you can take that out of the conditional expectation and you get the conditional um, expected dynamics of M under measure P plus the quantity um, 1 over the left limit of L times the conditional quadratic covariation of M and L. Now M is a martingale under measure P, so that's the conditional uh, expected dynamics of M equals zero, and we get our final result. So this theorem gives you a, uh, a method to apply Gerson's theorem. The first step will be to define the rather negative than a derivative L, and you define that function in such a way that you get an expected value of 1 and that L is a martingale. That's the first step and the second step is just to apply the formula. So you need to know what's the conditional quadratic covariation of those processes. So as an example, I apply Bertinus theorem, theorem, theorem on a compound Poisson process. So the first step is to define my stochastic process L as a geometric jump process. The LT equals L, uh, left limit of LT DMT. This definition, definition ensures that firstly L is a martingale and secondly the expected value of L equals 1. And my martingale is defined as the compensated compound Poisson process. So it's a compound Poisson process minus lambda, the expected jump, times t. The second step of applying Gerson's theorem is then just to apply the formula we derive. So we get the uh, con um, conditional covariation between M and L, and using DLT's formula, we just get the left, the conditional expectation of the left limit times the quadratic variation inside the conditional expectation all over the left limit of L. Okay, now if we go back to the formula for, for MT, if we take the dynamics DMT equals DYT minus lambda times expected jumps dt and we square that, then you can use um, the fact that 
dt squared is almost equal to zero. That can be derived heuristically. The idea there is that if dt t is very small, it, if you square it, it's even smaller, and you can say it's, it's equal to zero. And n dt times dt is almost equal to zero. You can also derive that heuristically. So then dmt squared, the, the dynamics of your uh, stochastic process m squared, is just the dynamics of your compound Poisson process squared. Okay, and then we use the result of uh, the conditional quadratic variation of a compound Poisson process. Therefore, if we just uh, put everything together, the, the Martingale M, which has, which is a Martingale under measure P, the conditional expected dynamics changes with a change of measure to measure P star by a quantity lambda, the expected jump squared uh, T. Okay, and then we can also uh, show the result that the, the um, compound Poisson process under measure P star has conditional expected uh, dynamics which changes with the quantity lambda expected value of the jump squared dp. Okay, now for the rest of this example, uh, we just use um, a certain formula to make our uh, a logic to make a logical implication of personal theorem. So if we de define x in that manner as showed in the presentation, then it can be shown that the the um, expected jump equals lambda tilde over lambda minus 1. And the expected jump squared is 1 plus c, where c is defined as lambda tilde over lambda minus n, times the expected jump with jump distribution mu tilde minus c. And the, the expected value of um, mu tilde and nu is used in these um, formulas. And finally, we can just derive the result that this expected conditional um, dynamics of the compound Poisson process under measure P star as, a, as expectation lambda tilde times the expected jump uh, for uh, distribution nu tilde dt, which means that your jump distribution changes as well as your jump intensity with a change of measure. Okay, so our implication on calibration is if you go back to one factor diffusion processes uh, under measure P which can be defined with that stochastic differential equation. That is a well-known uh, stochastic differential equation used in uh, modeling. Then, where W is a uh, Brownian motion, standard Brownian motion, then you can apply Gerson's, Gerson's theorem to show that the drift coefficient mu changes with a change of measure, but not the volatility coefficient. And the implication on model calibration is that if you define a model under a risk neutral, neutral measure P star, then you can use market data to estimate the volatilities, either by implied volatilities or historical volatilities. And that's the standard approach to use in short rate modeling, is to define the model under the risk neutral measure P star, where the measure P is a measure that describes uh, the market, the real world. So for, if we use a compound Poisson process, then we've just showed, showed with an example that the jump intensity changes as well as the jump distribution. The implication of this is that it complicates calibration of a compound Poisson pr process to market data. All of the parameters you have will change with a change of measure. And the question is then, how do you calibrate the market data? So in my thesis, I 
extended these results to non-stationary compound poison processes and I addressed the issue of calibration although there are um, a lot of work that still needs to be done for calibration. And the, the um, bibliography I have for today is three textbooks. The, the theory, very theoretical textbook is the one from Prater, Stochastic Integration and Differential Equations. Then Kuro, from Kuro I got that lemma I used in the uh, proof of personal sphere and Prevolts as the last example of the compound Poisson process um, as part of that textbook. And I must say, for someone with a statistical background, the Stochastic Finance book from Prevolt um, is easier to read than some of the more mathematical textbooks for me. Okay, and that's the end of my um, presentation. I think I've went a bit too quickly through the slides. Uh, thank you, Kevin.